Uh, again, my name is Tioma. I'm a contemporary dancer and choreographer based in Montreal, Canada. And as Paula said, I'm John McCallum, a composer uh, based in Oakland, California. For our presentation today, we want to begin by uh, sharing some background and excerpts from our past work to lay the foundation for the collaborative project that we're pursuing here at IRCAM. So John will share first. I'll just uh, give you a little background about myself. Um, I'm, like I said, based in California. I've been at uh, UC Berkeley for the past, uh, I think, 10 years or so. Um, first as a graduate student in composition, uh, and then as a, uh, as a researcher at the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies. Um, during my time at CENMAT, I've had a, an opportunity to work on a lot of interesting projects that have had a lot of overlap with my um, sort of compositional uh, interests and ambitions. Uh, one of these projects was um, uh, to design some software to facilitate uh, the composition and live performance of music in which the different instrumentalists perform in tempos that shift uh, continuously and gradually over time, uh, independent of one another. Um, this was mainly uh, headed up by Edmund Campion um, and has a long history before I arrived at CENMAT. Uh, in particular, I began working on it with Matt Wright, who some of you I think know. Um, and it, it even goes back, I believe that Edmund started working on some of that project here at Yearcom when he was here many years ago. Um, and it comes out of the tradition of experiments with musical time um, of the sort that you would see in the music of Griset or Xenakis or uh, Colin Nancaro or Steve Reich or your favorite uh, composer. Um, so as I was thinking through some of, uh, some of the ideas about how I wanted to use the tools that I, that I was developing in the context of this project, uh, I was beginning to work on a piece for three percussionists, and um, I had this idea that they would be spatially distributed, so they, but quite far from each other, uh, in three dimensions. So they would be they would be high and far from each other. Uh, and as I was thinking through this, just it was a little bit silly, but I'm thinking to myself, well, whatever happens, they need click tracks. They need click tracks to make sure that the public who would be on the bottom floor would um, would associate all of these things and they would sound like they're happening simultaneously. As I'm thinking through the project, I thought, well, it'd be amazing if the public could walk around and so on. And, but then I realized, of course, that the person who ends up close to the person furthest away, uh, the click tracks have made it worse for that person, right? So there's not really nothing you can do about this. There's nothing you can do to mitigate this problem with technology. Um, and But that wasn't the main revelation. The, the main revelation for me, again, it might be trivial, but um, for me, I realized that uh, this isn't just a feature of an extreme performance situation. This is a feature of all performance situations. There is no real synchronicity in time if you have two people uh, separated in space, right? So um, it just happens that in conventional performance situations, these issues are mitigated by very small distances, reverberation, and, and playing quite accurately together, um, separated by a small distance. That being said, I began to think a lot about um, musical time and performance, and I sort of, I sort of understood music performance as uh, m multiple people working together to approximate some sort of perfect piece of music that exists in the ether somewhere. Um, and I began to want to try to explore this basic concept in uh, in this piece that I was writing for a percussion trio. So the the piece uh, is called Aberration. Um, it's for uh, three three players, each with nine instruments, grouped in three groups of three. Um, and what I did with this is I assigned a different tempo to each performer. Here you can see a, a plot of how the tempos work. They all begin together, and about a minute in, they begin to drift apart slowly. Um, and they stay, uh, the tempos stay, well, they, they change continuously for the rest of the piece and they, they never come together except for the very last note of the piece. Um, the idea was then that you can imagine the original tempo that they begin playing in uh, continues to run throughout the background of the piece even though nobody's playing in it. So it's continuously there, but it's a sort of, um, it's a sort of shadow or something. Uh, and at times, I would try to choose the rhythms carefully so as to approximate the, the, this fourth tempo with um, the, the material of the, the people playing in these three different tempos. So you can imagine, for example, here's, a, here's an image where at the top you have uh, just 16th notes in this fourth tempo that's running. And then you see these three lines below, um, blue, green, and red. Uh, each number represents a beat. 
and the little dots in between represents subdivisions of that beat into three, four, and <coughs> five parts. Then this algorithm runs and tries to find a reasonably close approximation of, the, of this virtual line with the material of, this, of these other lines. And uh, we sort of end up with some musical figure that approximates this, this extra line. So um, I'm just going to show a couple of pages of the score, and then I'll play a short excerpt. And um, uh, yeah, OK, so here's the first page of the score. Um, just to show the notation, um, there are three players. You see two systems, three players for, for each system, and each player has three lines. And each line can have a note below, on, or above the line. So each line represents a group of three instruments. Um, the interesting sort of feature of this notation is that uh, time is represented spatially in the score. So this is, this is not like a conventional score in which time is not represented, and, and that the width of the bar um, is, meant, is sized according to uh, uh, ideas of conserving space. Here, um, it actually represents real time. Um, a couple of pages later, this is the moment when the three instruments begin to drift apart, the top two uh, begin to speed up and the bottom one begins to slow down gradually. And you can see that uh, this is represented in the orientation and, and relationship of the bar lines uh, and the, the rhythmic figures and so on. Uh, this is the first moment down in the second system uh, towards the middle where the three instruments begin to play slightly more complicated uh, rhythms that are meant to interlock to form an approximation of this fourth uh, tempo. So throughout the piece, uh, the, the players alternate between that texture and playing uh, simple rhythms, often eighth notes, uh, just in their own tempo, which, of course, by virtue of them being in, in three different tempos, has a sort of, uh, uh, the composite is a sort of complex texture. Um, towards the end of the piece, this fourth tempo is beginning to slow down gradually. And uh, once it gets slow enough, the three performers begin playing all four tempos at once. So they begin to play, uh, you can see notated here towards the end of the top system and throughout the bottom, uh, the notes with the stems down are, the, are just eighth notes in their own tempo, and the notes with the stems up are being passed around and interlocked to form this music in this fourth tempo. Uh, and then finally, another page where uh, we can see this fourth line has begun to slow way down, and it's, again, represented spatially. So every system represents about 10 seconds or so. Um, so I'm just going to play a short excerpt uh, from the end of the piece uh, leading up to this page here, and, uh, and I'll stop it. Unfortunately, we, we don't have so much time, so I'll, I just want to play a quick ex excerpt, but all this stuff is on the, is on the web. So I'm just going to get out of here. Oh, I should just introduce these people. Uh, this is a percussion trio uh, based in California. They're actually, they live in Sacramento now, but they were in the Bay Area at this point. Uh, this is Chris Froh, uh, Lauren Mock, and Dan Kennedy. And you can sort of see here these instruments that they've chosen. I didn't prescribe the instruments. I just described how the nine should work. So they have three piccolo wood blocks, three planks of wood, and three, um, three uh, bongos, and a, two bongos and a Chinese tom. OK.
So there's a little bit further that follows after the end of that, but that's a sort of section where you can hear all four lines going at once. Um, I know it's a little bit difficult to hear at times, but um, if you sort of squint your ears a little bit, it'll sometimes pop out. Um, okay, so after that, um, I began to work on a piece for eight players. Um, <clears throat> flute, clarinet, saxophone, two percussion, violin, viola, cello, and um, one of the things that I was, one of the things I didn't want to do was give everybody a click track. And the, I know that players don't like performing with click tracks. Players train their lives to really, um, to try to listen to the environment around them. And it's, that's made much more difficult if, they're, if they have to have a click in their ear. So uh, one of the things I tried to do with, one of the things I thought would be an, interest, an interesting experiment for this piece would be to give click tracks to some people and also introduce a conductor who would also have a click track. So in this case, we have these eight players, the clarinet, sax, and two percussion are uh, each have a click track, and the conductor then conducts the flute and the three strings. Um, the idea also of taking away the, uh, the click track for the flute and the three strings would be that they could, they could maybe play a little bit more naturally in a, in a more chamber-like chamber ensemble setting. Um, and I think it worked pretty well, and definitely having a conductor on stage um, to be able to listen and give large cues and, and dynamic information to the group was extremely helpful. So um, the other feature of this piece is that there are these moments where everybody does a line and, and play a chord uh, together, despite the tempos never actually being together throughout the piece. That's not true. They're together for one, one small part. Um, so here's a page. I'm going to play two short excerpts just so you get a sense of some of the textures that I'm exploring in this piece. Um, the first excerpt will end at this at letter C here with this big uh, thing together. And the second ex excerpt is from later on in the piece um, and also uh, is, is, again, a, no a number of instruments playing in different, different times, uh, different tempos, and ending with a, uh, a sharp attack together, sort of together. So here's the first example. Just a second example, um, again, sort of exploring the textures that become available to a composer when you remove the, the common clock that binds performers together. Here we go.
So, um, right. That's a, just a brief sort of introduction to the kind of work that I've been doing for the past couple of pieces and a uh, few years, um, just as a way of showing some of the interests that I've had that are, that have, that are sort of forming the foundation of the, the current project that, uh, that we're here to work on. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Tioma, who will tell you a little bit about herself and uh, show some <coughs> of her work. Perfect. Hi. Uh, so I mentioned I'm a contemporary dancer and choreographer, and my creations integrate movement with responsive video, audio, and sensor technologies to explore vulnerability and intimacy in both live and virtual interactions. I'm really curious about uh, myriad ways in which we read and write meaning from bodies on stage and in daily life, be it through sensory perception or ways in which this process is increasingly mediated by technologies for stage, social media, and medicine. And in my work, I'm very interested in performer agency to conceal and reveal aspects of oneself, as well as tensions between external expression versus internal experience inside the body. My work with digital technologies uh, began in around 2004, 2005 through an interest in Dance for Camera. And I was really drawn to the ability of uh, video to uh, direct the viewer's eye through framing uh, intimate details of bodies, movement, uh, and environments, as well as possibilities to construct uh, nonlinear time and space through video editing. Uh, however, the more I worked with uh, choreography for the screen and with the camera, uh, I became very aware of the potential of the camera both to build closeness or intimacy with a performer, uh, but also the camera as an invasive uh, presence for monitoring or surveilling the body. And I wanted to explore this relationship of agency between uh, performers, cameras, and viewers in greater detail. So <clears throat> this led uh, to an investigation of the dancers themselves as the filmmakers. The dancers manipulating cameras on their own body to frame movement as well as on one another's bodies. And the results of this are projected in real time for the audience. So this gives a different relationship between the dancer uh, directly with the materiality and presence of the camera. Out of this interest, uh, I developed a piece titled <coughs> Gently Between Us in 2011. Uh, this time I was working at the Experimental Media and Movement Arts Lab at the Ohio State University, uh, first as a graduate student and then as a visiting professor. Uh, so this project was a collaboration with media designer Sean Hove and composer Tristan Soufert. Uh, it's a, about a 30-minute piece, and I'm going to uh, show a three-minute excerpt, but it's not continuous. It's moments selected from throughout the piece to demonstrate different relationships that were being constructed between the performers and media. I will exit here.
on with our audio. Uh, and something I want to mention that maybe isn't evident from the video is that uh, all of the audio in the piece is being generated live. There's a musician on stage who unfortunately you can't see in this video. So uh, the, all of the audio was sampled from the bodies and vocalization of the dancers during rehearsal, and some of it is also live through microphones on the stage that, that he's using. Uh, so in this piece, the negotiation of, of agency between the dancers with the digital media uh, has become a topic of the performance itself, and this is true in several of my projects, uh, including a recent collaboration uh, with John and Adrian Freed at Sinmat, uh, which, uh, in, which is called X. It's a duet for dancer and uh, Connect, the Microsoft Connect camera. Uh, in which I engage very directly with the uh, material presence of the camera and tripod, uh, as well as the mediated sound environment. Uh, I'm interested in this, in this project and in my work, uh, not only in revealing and examining embodied experience, uh, but also interacting or engaging with media in ways which can trigger a heightened kinesthetic awareness or state for the performer. Uh, this has become particularly relevant in my collaboration with researchers uh, at SIMMA and also at the Topological Media Lab at Concordia University, which is in Montreal. I've been working with a lot of interactive uh, sound designers to create environments. I'm going to pull up my, my presentation again. Um. <clears throat> So here are some uh, images from a recent collaboration uh, with composer Navid Nawab, who is at, at TML at Concordia. Uh, we were working in the hexagram spaces. And in the project we developed, uh, which is titled Beneath the Pavement and Ocean, uh, we were really interested in, uh, in developing sound environments or climates that trigger a very intense and immediate kinesthetic response from the performer uh, that gives new information about their body. Uh, so for example, one section of the piece we titled The Wall of Sound. Uh, and in this section, there's a very uh, pervasive, dense drone that is filling the space. Uh, the dancers are being tracked through infrared cameras, as well as contact microphones in the ground to capture the weight of their bodies. Uh, and only through uh, extreme speed, scale, momentum, and, and really uh, making impact with their bodies in the ground are the dancers able to transform this wall of sound, uh, both qualitatively, so that the textures begin to transform, and also spatially. Uh, and in this scenario, uh, it's one example in which we really saw the dancers push their physicality and athleticism to, to a new extreme, moving toward, towards exhaustion. Uh, it really transformed their bodies. Uh, as I strive to, to trigger more extreme uh, performative states uh, via mediated environments, I'm curious not only about the external uh, expression of the performers, but also regarding their uh, internal bodily processes. In uh, my recent project titled Experience Number 1167, uh, I moved away from the stage to create an installation uh, in which the audience is in close proximity, 360 degrees around the dancer. Uh, mm -hmm. This, this piece is a solo, uh, and for the duration of the piece, about 20 minutes, the dancer lies glued on her back as if she's confined inside an MRI machine. Uh, her movement is very restricted within her core or a single body part. She's surrounded by a mass of equipment. There are multiple cameras, monitors, microphones, speakers, and cables that extend from her body into the space and up to the ceiling to create a sculpture. Uh, but which is fully functional. This, this system is all operating. Um, and I'm going to show a short video uh, excerpt from this piece as well before I speak about it in a little more detail. <clears throat> this is a 15 to 20 minute piece. You're seeing uh, three minutes non-contiguous material.
So the <coughs> full video of this piece and the other clip that I showed are available on my website. <coughs> uh, in this piece, uh, the performer is very much being monitored and surveilled by the technology as well as the gaze of the public. The presence of the technology could seem invasive on the one hand, and it, it is, uh, but it's also uh, facilitating uh, greater intimacy with the audience through making evident aspects of the performer's experience. Uh, as the piece progresses, the performer has some strategies for agency regarding what, how, and when she uh, is exposed to the audience. It is her action or inaction as, uh, as well as the quality of each act which is impacting the video and audio environment. She also returns her gaze directly to the audience uh, via the camera and directly eye contact. So uh, <clears throat> the work that I've shared today lays a foundation for my interest in this project and collaboration with John. And we were uh, you know, amused uh, this morning looking at just how different our work is. Uh, but as we shift now to speaking uh, directly about our collaboration here, some of the points of, of overlap and convergence will become more clear. <clears throat> okay, so we'll begin uh, by walking through a, a system diagram, a map of all of the elements that are involved in our project to give you the big picture. We're creating an evening length performance for 12 contemporary dancers, 12 live musicians, and also live electronics. In the performance, each of the dancers will be wearing an ECG, an electrocardiogram, device to monitor their heart rate. And uh, right now we are using a single lead ECG board uh, developed by SparkFun. Uh, yes, we, we have it here if anyone wants to, uh, <laughs> to see it. Yeah. Uh, the ECG data from the dancers will be transmitted wirelessly. Uh, for this we're using the XOSC board which transmits OSC uh, over Wi-Fi. Also take a look at this uh, after the presentation if you want to come see it. Uh, all of this heart rate data from the dancers will be processed and used to create click tracks that determine the tempo of the live musicians. And this uh, ECG data will also be sent to a computer which is running a max patch to generate sound in real time so that it can make temporally and contextually aware decisions during the performance. So as the choreographer, the performance scenario that we've set up provides a, a number of challenges which relate to my, my past work and my interests. I will be choreographing not only the movement of uh, the dancers in space and time, but also intentional shifts and arcs in their heart rates over time, because these correspond to a temporal transformation in the music. Uh, this will uh, involve a lot of collaboration with the dancers to find an emotional, psychological, uh, physical pathway that is unique to each individual to, to find the desired results. Uh, and in my past work, I have paid a lot of attention to both internal and external experience in the body, but what is very different here is, uh, first of all, the dependency of the music on, on the reliability of the, on the dancers, uh, as well as the fact that uh, the progress of the dancer's heart will be projected in real time uh, to the audience. Um, so during the uh, rehearsal and performance process, the dancers will be receiving uh, some biofeedback in the form of musical tempo uh, to, to both know, uh, to have information about what's happening inside their body, uh, also as a way you know, to push them towards uh, greater exertion or greater relaxation, uh, as the case may be. Uh, given that Dancer, well, everyone's bodies are, are constantly in flux. Uh, we're actually very interested in and, and want to embrace the variability that will exist between the prescribed uh, score for the pathway of a heart rate uh, versus the execution or the, the realization during performance. Uh, this, however, 
creates uh, creates a set of problems that we're going to need to dialogue about during our you know early research phase, as well as the creation and performance phases of the project uh, through discussion. Yeah, composer. So um, compositionally, this is a very complicated problem, uh, as you as I think you can imagine. Um, I intend to create a, a, a score for, for the performers and, and parts, uh, and also a, a max patch. And these things, um, they, uh, they associate um, events with time, and they, they create relationships between sonic events and so on. Um, but uh, because of the fact that they'll be realized differently every time, these tempos will be different every time there's a rehearsal or a performance or, or anything, I can't do things as simple as create, uh, as write, compose or orchestrate a simultaneity, right? I can't write two events at the same time and expect to have them heard um, in it with any de reasonable degree of reliability. So, uh, but that's, that's actually okay. Um, earlier in the talk, I said something like, um, I, I think that musical, the idea of musical Musical simultaneity is really a, it's really a, a construct of, of notation and that in performance we don't have simultaneity we have a very small window of time uh, which fluctuates um, throughout the the piece the the boundaries of this window are fluctuating throughout the piece and they range from imperceptible to unacceptable um, and this is an opportunity I think to uh, expand that window to the point that we have musical material and uh, and that it be becomes elevated to the level of, uh, of, of form and of structure. Um, so at this point, um, before moving on to the more technical details of what we want to accomplish um, and what we need to do in order to make all of this um, sort of happen, um, uh, we should mention that this this part of the diagram here it, it involves a lot of hand waving. We've just said, well, we take this data and we send it over to this thing and can, and construct click tracks and stuff. Um, so we should take this away and uh, build up a, a slightly more um, thorough sort of representation of what's going on here. So this data, as it's transmitted, uh, ends up at a computer that's responsible for data processing and representation. So we need a set of tools for um, for looking at this data and understanding it as we as we develop the piece. Uh, the first thing that happens here is sort of analysis and signal conditioning and processing. Um, we do some QRS complex classification. This is um, the QRS complex is the sort of uh, normal representation of a heart uh, of the heart waveform as picked up by an ECG. We do beat detection and so on. This higher level data is what's actually sent to the max patch so that it can do um, contextually aware uh, processing. Um, and it's also uh, subjected to a variety of visual, uh, visualization and sonification um, uh, schemes, one of which is the click track, which aids in rehearsal and performance. Um, in addition, we'll be doing, as you can probably imagine, some time domain visualization, potentially with uh, correlation with video. Um, and this is a pretty critical step in the process to help us understand the difference between uh, what was prescribed by the score and the plan uh, and what was actually realized in rehearsal and performance. I think you can maybe imagine that um, the relationship, as soon as, as, soon as the, the dancers begin dancing, uh, the relationship between what we're hearing and what the score says is, is going to be of such complexity that I don't think that my ear is enough to, um, to understand the relationship. So here we need other tools that will help, that will help us um, understand this, what, the nature of this window that I was talking about. Um, so this is for both of us, of course. The, this, is, this will help Tioma as well to communicate with the dancers and to um, uh, constantly revise the material um, so that we can, we can continually try things out and go back and revise and try things out and revise and so on. So um, we've, been, we've been hard at work uh, in the first two weeks and actually just got to the point where we could uh, record some data and compare with um, what we've what with some tests um, and actually this just happened yesterday which is uh, we're showing off uh, something very new so we started with a little um, just a test the idea here is that Tioma would um, would do some improvisation try to keep her heart rate around 80 beats per minute and then uh, do um, movement designed to raise her heart rate up to 180 and then um, begin to relax and try to have her heart rate go back to where it was at the beginning um, of course, 
we go into this knowing that there's no way that the heart rate is going to go up and turn a sharp corner and come back down. So this is this is not meant to be, um, you know, we know it's we know that it's not yeah, going to look I like think this. I but, pretty well. but we're <laughs> but we're curious about the relationship of what does happen to a, a model like this. So uh, during this improvisation, we we used this model as a structure for my movement. Uh, and we, we did maybe three or four run-throughs of this model. And uh, as I moved, I was hearing uh, my heart beat being sonified, so I had that biofeedback. Uh, and John also gave me indications of when to begin uh, ascending and when to begin the descent of my heart rate. To begin lowering my heart rate, uh, you know, I've, I found that this is actually quite difficult to sustain my heart rate while I am moving at a low rate. Uh, without too much variability, and uh, really uh, finding ways to connect mind and body uh, experience through breathing, meditative state, visualizations, as well as movement uh, has been significant. So let's look at the, the first run through here. I was able to, uh, you know, start at a fairly low rate and reach the target, and as we practice and extend the piece, uh, the, uh, the low the low goal and the high goal are going to be farther apart so that I will have to you know, exert uh, more energy to reach these goals. Um, what we see in this run through, and again, let's look at the second run through, they're actually quite similar. I'm, I'm doing different movement, but with the same goal uh, to, to shift my heart rate in this path. Um, one thing that we see is that as my heart rate begins to descend, there, uh, there's a bit of, a, of an upward curve. And uh, something I realized in these experiments is that uh, the descent of my heart rate is a bit more of a passive process, especially when I've been highly active and, you know, of course I have strategies to help impact this. But looking at this information from our, our very initial test and how this manifests in my body, we would have a choice, you know, perhaps we would uh, change our model so that we create a larger curve during the descent of my heart rate. Right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So this, so the idea here is that these these curves, which become, we they become prescriptive and they become a tool for for me to compose for Tioma to direct. Um, oh, look at that! I haven't completed my time machine backup. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, these curves, they they can't be designed in a vacuum. They have to take into account what human bodies do, and they really ought to be uh, tuned according to the, the specific people that we're working with. So this is a way of beginning to understand what people can do, and then we can adjust um, the the underlying structure of the work uh, to better fit them. The idea is not to is not to be overly prescriptive or restrictive to to a group of people, but rather to develop material that coincides with what we what we um, have come to know about them. I should also just say um, on a technical note that you'll notice that the data is fairly noisy, especially these moments when there's a trend up and then it drops way down. So we have still some problems with some noise um, and these are, these are caused by false positives and false negatives. Um, this These two plots are uh, eight point averages over time. So uh, in fact, a false negative affects the average for quite some time. So we, we think we know how to get rid of some of this. Some of it had to do with um, the fact that we didn't change the electrodes between runs and sweat was becoming a problem. Um, we also have a, a very ridiculous system for uh, harnessing this thing to Tioma and it's very precarious. So we have some challenges there, hardware, and, and also there are some, um, some issues in the software as well. But it's, it's pretty reasonable at this point. We did one additional experiment, which was the inverse pathway. I began with my heart rate. Uh, up around 180, or this was the model, this was the goal, to begin around 180, drop down to 80, climb back up to 180 uh, each in a, a minute and a half. So let's take a look at how I did. I had trouble in this amount of time getting back down to, to 80 beats per minute, and second run through, I had even more trouble. <laughs> so, you know, th this gave us information that either we can change our model, uh, to adapt to how my body was operating at that time, or I could do some more training and practice, get better. Uh, I also think that, you know, given more time, I could achieve this arc. It was just, uh, our, our ideal arc was just too fast. Yeah, so that's a big question, is what, what do we want to do? Who, who, do, who adapts and, and how do we approach the, the creative and rehearsal process? So we're, this is the, the part of the investigation that we're interested in right now.
Um, so going back to this, uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, which is a, maybe in, in this diagram, um, in terms of the work that I'm interested in doing during this residency, this is maybe the most important part, uh, or one of the most important parts, which is this idea that the data that we collect from these ECGs as the performance is happening or a rehearsal is happening uh, could be used to produce what I might call a descriptive score as, as opposed to a prescriptive score. So the idea here is that we could have a score that um, has a relationship to the original score in the sense that the notation is the same, but it would show the actual relationship in time of the different parts as they were performed. So you can imagine something uh, like this being the prescriptive score and uh, in real time as the uh, movement was happening and the piece was evolving, the piece, the, the score would gradually transform into, uh, to, to display the relationship so that I can see and communicate with, um, with the various people responsible um, for producing the material. Uh, and that's something that Jean and I have been talking about for a while and, uh, and are beginning to look into now, Jean Bresson. Uh, so our, our goals for this three-month uh, residency period are to, uh, to further develop the, the skills and knowledge that we need on both a technical uh, and creative front for this project. We're going to develop a short piece for two or three dancers and two or three musicians uh, while we were here, while we are here to share in a, a lecture demonstration uh, and use this um, uh, following our, our residency uh, to find uh, additional uh, resources for the production of an evening length piece. So thank you for listening. If you have any um, questions or comments, we can uh, discuss now a bit. Thank you a lot. There is some question. Ah. In the final piece, you, how many dancers do you imagine? On, on stage? Uh, twelve dancers and twelve musicians. It seems like a reasonable level of complexity. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm wondering if you have already some specific ideas about the kind of movements you want, or if you've been trying to see which ones, because um, of course we imagine someone running, that would be the obvious thing to do, yeah. or jumping in some way to increase yeah. the heart rate and decrease it, but what kind of movements do you have in mind at this point? Yeah, well, uh, you know, in doing uh, these initial experiments during the last two weeks, um, my initial approach was definitely exertion to raise my heart rate and lie down to lower my heart rate. Um, so I've been curious about you know, all different possibilities and can I be doing uh, very uh, small and minute but quick movement to raise my heart rate, just, hy will hi just hyperventilating raise my heart rate. Um, in a general sense, I'm interested in uh, extremes of movement between uh, like very dynamic movement that drives through space uh, with whipping and diving of the dancer's body, so a lot of a lot of traveling and athleticism in the body, uh, versus a very subtle, uh, minute sensing of microprocesses in the body and how these sensory qualities and dynamics uh, spread and come become uh, movement. So there will be a, a very uh, wide range of contrast within the movement of the dancers. <laughs> Uh, the heart rate is highly correlated to the stress level, so you, we, we, one can accept a lot of differences between the experimentation and what's going to happen on stage. Yeah. So, uh, is that something you, how, how do you want to deal with that? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question, and it, uh, different environmental factors that are that are going to play into the experience of the performer in different contexts uh, are definitely very interesting to me. Uh, and I feel like a lot of the answers to these questions are going to come through our practice, through exper experiential uh, research. Um, I'm curious about when there can be you know, a disparity between uh, 
doing very fast and charged movement, but is there a way that I can have a, an internal calm or control of my breath that will, will mitigate that? Or can I appear very still on stage but have a racing heartbeat? Uh, of course, the, the environment and the interactions that I'm having with other dancers will play into this. I'm really curious about the impact of touch on the heart rate. We did some initial experiments with performers trying to sync their heart rates. Um, and you know, we discovered that through, through hugging, like whole body contact, they were able to, to sync their heart rates. Been exploring a little bit if uh, like touch of my own body can calm me down. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of questions at this point. I'd also say I'm really interested in the in exactly that we that going through the rehearsal process of uh, you know many many rehearsals and then finding that it's completely different in performance. I think this is a, this is an aspect of human performance which is very real, but it's not one that the audience often gets to 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 see or witness uh, unless there's unless something bad happens. Um, but I, I like this idea of revealing the. Um, the, the internal state of the performer in some, in some way. Um, you, you mentioned, and I think we, we saw in the data, that during really active movement, the EKG picks up other muscular signals besides the heartbeat. I was wondering if there was any opportunity to make that a, a positive thing instead of a negative thing to maybe have some kind of counterpoint within one performer where the heart rate is, is being tracked in one way, but other motions could produce another source of information or tempo, or is that something that could possibly be in the future, or uh, too many variables for this problem at the moment? We've talked a little bit about this. Um, my general feeling about it is that we should start simple, start with the heart rate, and see what emerges out of it. And so I'm, I think both of us are open to, to anything. Um, yeah, I think it's it's potentially very interesting. We've also talked about um, uh, monitoring respiration because it's it's correlated to the same types of things that the heart is, and and um, but it's a more visual it's a it's a it's a more visual aspect of of what the person is going through, and so anyway, these are things that we're certainly thinking about. Yeah, but for right now, I just want that gone. <laughs> <laughs> Did you consult with a cardiologist? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, right now I'm, I am the test subject, <laughs> and uh, no, I have not. Uh, I think there, you know, there are definitely some important uh, ethical questions as we begin to work with a cast uh, that we are aware of, and uh, you know, because we're in a research phase, we've just been reading like many, many articles, watching all of the videos of this type of work online that we can, speaking with people, and we are interested to engage with other fields. I mean, it's quite an interdisciplinary project, so. Yeah, we need to consider Good advice. <laughs> I have one more question. I'm not sure if you addressed this already, um, but how do you imagine visually the performers interacting with the dancers? Are they going to be on stage? It's Are they going to be reacting? Oh, okay. You've thought about this. Yes. We're, we're thinking yeah, it's about a it. Great we, question. Yeah, yeah, we I, don't, yeah, we don't know yet. I don't think we know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, we our very initial discussions. We intend to have the musicians on stage. Uh, I'm interested in choreographing things that they do. Uh, we've also discussed at certain points monitoring the heart rates of the musicians. Uh, it's not a, a side of the project we've developed yet, but we're interested. Yeah, okay. No more questions? Thank you a lot for this very interesting project collaborative and for, the, you. for your staying. Thank you very much.